Good evening and welcome to tonight's driver's ed session. So we'll wait for a minute or two for people to log in. So make sure that you put your name in the comments so I can look at the screen and see who's here. Don't forget to put your name. Text your name on your phone to me. So it looks like we've got about three. Good evening. Now well, people are starting to sign in. Everybody's popping in. Getting up there. See if we can get over 20. We've got 24 in the class, so I should be seeing 24 eyeballs. Unless some of you are viewing this with your friends. Just a couple things before we get going. Um, I did text out to some of you that I didn't have certain information, uh, but I was able to compile, kind of pull in where everybody was giving me stuff, whether it be through Eventbrite or through text messages. But um, I have sent in the entire roster to the state. So we are good. This class has now been submitted to the state and they know that you are enrolled in driver's ed. And the process of you getting your license has begun. So that is the good thing. It takes me about a day or two to uh, go through uh, birth certificates, those driving sheets that you filled out, uh, looking what you filled out in Eventbrite, looking for uh, mistakes to make sure that everything looks the same. Because sometimes people don't give me their uh, full name. They leave out middle name. I've even had people don't have their birthday right. Uh, or the year right. So I had to go through and uh, double check on everything, kind of line everything up with all the information that you were supposed to give me and uh, send that out to the state. Because remember, your license will be a legal document. Uh, it's also what you're going to be using to get uh, passports and visas and things like that. So besides original birth certificate, your license is going to be used a lot for show showing proof of who you are, and we're going to talk more about that on Monday. Um, I think everybody has joined the Facebook group. I think I sent out about an hour ago um, tonight's notice about having class. I'm going to try to do that every day so it reminds you to be here on time for the YouTube channel. Um, we're down to 18. Why are we not having all 24 people here? Okay, so at least I've got people on the screen for comments. So I know that you are here at the beginning. So that's pretty good. I'll line that up with uh, everybody's name. Um, let me get out of the music here. I usually just... Let's see, where is it? There we go. All right. Still kind of working through some of the kinks. We are also going to try to see a video that I did back in September about getting ready to drive. That's going to be the last half of tonight's class. I'm going to try to pull that in without downloading it onto my computer. It's a pretty big file. Um, it's going to be about 25 minutes long and that will take us at the very end of the class today to kind of review that. So tonight's class is really about getting ready to drive. Usually this is our third class. By this time uh, most of you have already driven with me. If we were actually at the high school, uh, tonight's lesson would be kind of a review of what we did in the car for the first time out. So when I do get to meet you for the first time and get you into the driver's ed vehicle, uh, before we move the vehicle, um, I need to know that you know where certain things are on the vehicle, and you understand why we're using them, uh, how to use them, and... Um, that takes up about 15, 10, 15 minutes before we go out on our first drive because 
not every car is the same. The windshield wipers may be a little bit different, uh, where they're located, uh, your emergency lights, uh, where are your parking lights, um, what is a dead pedal? Probably most of you don't even know what a dead pedal is. And I'm going to regress here for a moment. Don't worry about the pretest that you took. All that does is it gives me a basic understanding. And to be honest with you, I've looked at your score, but I haven't looked at what questions you got wrong. But it gives me some idea of how you're answering certain questions. And those questions are going to be a lot like what the midterm and the final is going to be. So that's the same platform that we're going to use. So, But if you got a 55, 60, 70, do not worry. It does not penalize you in the least. But it just gives me some idea of what you're getting right, what you're getting wrong from the get-go. And it gives me a chance to see how long it took you to take the test, whether you did the test. I think there are a few people that still haven't done it. So make sure that you uh, log in and do that. The other thing about Facebook is I just loaded on uh, two worksheets that we're going to be using at the end of tonight. So at the end of tonight's uh, class, you're going to go onto Facebook and download uh, those two sheets and you're going to write down your answers and take a picture of the piece of paper and try to take a picture down at the piece of paper. Some of you are taking it at, at an angle. Kind of take it, take it down so I can see a little bit better what you're writing and make sure it's really well illuminated. So I think that's it for housekeeping. Um, let's get right into tonight's tonight's class. Are you really ready to drive? The thing I want you to think about is driving a vehicle is a lot like a pilot getting ready to fly a plane. If you've ever flown before, you probably know that they keep you in a waiting area and then they get you ready to board. And while you're getting ready to board, the pilot is going through a checklist of what is functional, what is ready, am I good to go? Can you imagine if a pilot took off from an airport and he never checked the fuel gauge? I mean, think about it. You've been driving with your parents. I know most of you have. Has that really been something that you've really thought about? Have you told your parents, we're getting low on fuel? There are probably some of you who've never have pumped gas before. Okay, so that's going to be something new. Do you know how to do it safely? Do you know how to pay, pay for it? And I'll talk more about that in another class. But getting ready to drive is just a moment of, of thinking about, am I ready to put the car out on the road? Have I done everything that I need to to make sure that all my safety measures are, are taken into account? And do I know where I'm going? So that's what we're going to kind of focus on. So the first thing I want you to write down is that you should have an idea of where you're going. Now, when you drive with me, that's not your responsibility. That is something that I'm going to do with you. I usually will sit you down. Uh, in the driver's seat and I say today's lesson is going to be on angle parking. We're going to go uh, downtown Durham. We're going to go to Dover. We're going to do uh, multiple parking spots to the left. We're going to do some to the right. And when we get there, I want to make sure that you use your signal, check your mirrors, and your positioning in your parking spot is equal on both sides. So it gives you an idea. Okay, he told me where we're going. He's told me what he's looking for. It just gets you in the mindset of what you're going to do. Now, on a broader scale, let's say that you're a licensed driver and your parents have given you a list of some errands to do. Now, I've got on the screen right here, you're probably not familiar with all the route numbers in the area. Even though you've been a passenger for all these years, you've really never taken the time to think about, how do I get to Summersworth? How do I get to Rochester? Now, you probably know how to get to school. You probably know how to get to where you um, work. You know how to get to the mall. So places that you've done a whole bunch, it's going to be pretty easy. But when someone throws you a curveball, you've heard of some of these towns, but you may not know really the best way to get there. So also what I want you to write down is always look for the safest route to take and try to limit the stops that you make. You really don't want to be going around in a circle, you know, uh, doing your errands. You want to make it very linear from point A to point B, point B, back to point A. 
You don't want to go way out, out of your way, and then have to find your way back to a place that's going to waste fuel, waste time. Um, that's not good. Now, when it says, do you need directions? Most cars now are equipped with GPS. So this is what I want you to write down. Make sure your directions are inputted into the GPS before you leave. You do not want to do it while you're moving. Now, in cars, you can't do that. Okay, it's just not going to be functional. It won't allow you until you're in stopped or parked. But this is the problem. If you don't have it available through your car, a lot of people are using their cell phones. Your cell phone doesn't know that you're moving. And you can get into maps or whatever you're going to use for directions and do that while you're driving. I mean, it, it's functional. You shouldn't do it. But because it is functional, that's why you're doing it. Everything should be done prior to getting out on the road, in a driveway, in a parking lot. And I'm not going to quiz you on route numbers, but I am going to point them out to you when we start to drive. Second thing I want you to write down is when you get ready to drive, think about what kind of physical, emotional state I'm in. You don't have to write down all the, the bullets here, but just write down physical, emotional state. You're going to be surprised when you start driving on a regular basis, how much your mindset, what frame of mind that you're in will come into play when you're driving. Because think about it, when you're depressed, you're probably not going to be picking up maybe pedestrians and signs. When you're really excited, you're going to probably go faster than you normally do. Let's just say that you got a text message at school saying that your cousin that you haven't seen in a couple of years has decided to make a surprise visit. Now you're excited to get home. I almost guarantee that you're not gonna probably be going the speed limit. Gotta keep that in check. You gotta think about, I've gotta do what I know is safe. I've gotta do what is right behind the wheel of the car. Now, of course, drugs and alcohol come into play. That's gonna affect you emotionally and physically. We'll get more into that in another week when we talk about that. And the last thing is, anytime that you find that you um, have uh, sprains, or soreness with your back or your neck, that will limit a movement which will affect the way that you drive. Uh, today I had to drive to Newington uh, because my wife has sprained her foot, her right foot. She did not feel comfortable driving, so she asked me if I would take her to Newington. So she knew it wasn't a safe thing to do and I was willing to do it. And by the way, when I was driving to Newington, I did decide to stop by the DMV and um, I did get manuals. Now, unfortunately, I can't get them to you. So I do have hard copies of manuals. So maybe if we do start driving at some time soon, um, I can actually give you a hard copy. They weren't too optimistic about when testing was going to take place. So I'll try to keep you up to date on that. But I did speak to them. Next thing I want you to write down is weather. So most of the time when I'm showing you these slides is really write down the top header. That That is just an overview of something that you're going to think about. Okay, let's kind of put it seven months from now. You're going to be approaching the beginning of winter and that's going to pose certain problems. So we know driving in the winter, we've got to stop earlier. We've got to go at lower speeds. We've got to make sure we've got an ice scraper. We've got to make sure that we've got... Uh, windshield washer fluid, we've got to make sure we've got a defroster that works well. So when you're driving in different types of weather, you're going to think about, do I have everything available to me that I may need today? Because once you're out on the road, you're not going to be able to get these things. You're not going to be able to get that ice scraper. Now, weather, rain, we're going to have that all 12 months. So that is the one uh, type of weather when you're driving with me. It's funny when I get students starting to drive and we get a good rainstorm. I'll always get a text from somebody, Mr. Toll, it's raining today. Are we still driving? Well, yeah. I mean, you're going to have to drive in the rain at some point in your life. So yeah, we're going to drive in it. Very rarely will I cancel a driving lesson because of weather. The only time would be in the winter time when school is canceled and the pl plows are out. But if it's actively snowing and the roads aren't that bad, we've driven many hours. I mean, that's good experience. That's what you want to get good at. So we only don't want to drive when we're going to be a problem to other people on the road. Or there's a chance that someone could slip and slide and hit us.
Next thing I want you to write down is traffic conditions. Whenever you get a chance to drive, think about, am I going into an area that has a high volume of traffic? The more traffic there is, the longer your drive will probably take and the more of a chance of something bad happening. Doesn't mean that you're on a back road and there's nobody out there that there could be one or two cars go by and one of them may run you off the road. That could happen. But it's a lot different when you constantly have four or five cars by you at all times because then the likelihood is is greater. So I put on the on the slide here a few situations when you may want to try to limit uh, your, your driving. Now, before school and after school, you've got to get there, you've got to go home. But this is more for learning to drive. I've had parents say, oh yeah, I'm going to start driving with my son or daughter soon. I'll let them drive to school in the morning. I'll ask, well, how many times have they driven? Well, they've driven around the neighborhood once or twice. They've probably done about an hour, hour and a half. Well, how far do you live from the school? Oh, probably about 20, 25 minutes. Well, that may not be the best time to take them to school. They've only got an hour and a half. They're going to be pretty stressed when they get into the parking lot and all these cars backing out of spots and pulling up. So think about where do you go and who you're going to be around when you drive. That is the driver's ed vehicle, and you'll see that in the video a little bit later tonight. Uh, but as you, and I want you to write this down, this is really important, the next probably four or five slides. Any car that has been left unattended, you should always approach it and look on both sides, front and back. So you're looking left and right, front and back. You're trying to look around the vehicle to make sure that there's nothing like bottles or debris or a shopping cart around your car. You're going to an extreme to make sure that you're okay. I'll guarantee you we'll go back to that pilot. He may not go outside, but there's someone outside of that airplane looking at those those tires as they go down the run before they go down the runway. They're looking at all the wings and the tail, making sure there's no loose bolts. You've got to make sure that plane is safe before it gets up in the air. The same thing with your car. You should make sure that it's safe before you get out there on the road. So here's what I want you to write down. What would you be looking for if you're looking around the vehicle? Tires, you're looking at, do they look soft? Lights, fluids. Now license plate, a lot of people say, why would I be looking at my license plate? You'd be surprised how many people don't realize they only have one license plate, one license plate on their vehicle. Someone had taken either the rear or the front one off. If you're in a, in a mall, if someone is stealing a car, they're more likely to steal a car, take the plates off, and put on stolen plates so they take them off your vehicle and put it on the stolen car. Or you pull up to a curb and the license plate is just about even, the bottom of the plate is even with the curb, and when you pull off the curb, it pulls it away from the car. So those are reasons why you're looking around your car. Make sure you still have a license plate. Make sure nobody's broken your windows. Make sure that there's nobody around your vehicle. And that's what carjacking is. I'm gonna give you, the definition will be on the video that you'll see, so I'm not gonna talk about that. But I will show you, oh, always check for animals. If you've got animals around your vehicle, you wanna make sure that uh, cats love to get up around the tires, get up around the engine. So just hit the car, hit it a couple times, scare the animal away, and you should be good to go. Um, can you imagine if you lived in Florida, this is what you might see. Let's see if this is the next slide. Oh, that's carjacking. I'll come back to that in a minute. Here's the Florida slide I wanted to show you. Can you imagine if you went outside and you saw an alligator underneath your car, what it would be like. That's why you've got to check around. Now let's go back to carjacking. Um, this is what I want you to write down. Anytime that you're at a stop sign traffic light or in a parking lot, you've got to assume that there's someone looking at you get into your vehicle. The easiest car to steal is the car that's being unlocked or a car that's running. So think about it. If you're your doors aren't locked and you're at a stop sign. Someone could just open the door and jump right in. 
Same thing at a traffic light or in a parking lot. So it's so important to make sure that your doors are locked at all times. So when you approach your vehicle, make sure there's nobody in it, nobody underneath it. And you think underneath, there was a story of a young girl in Massachusetts that was working at a mall. She went out to her vehicle after her shift was over. She had her keys in her hand. And as she went to unlock her vehicle, someone rolled from underneath the vehicle and went around the back of her legs with a knife and cut both Achilles tendons. She fell to the ground. He took the keys that were in her hand because she was unlocking her door and he took her car and she couldn't get up to run for help. She could only scream. Someone cuts your Achilles tendons, you can't stand up. So here's the um, carjacking. We'll talk about this afterwards. Top this noon, a developing story out of Kalamazoo County. One man is dead, another arrested for the shooting and carjacking. 24 Hour News 8's Tony Taliavia is working this story. He's on the phone right now with new information. Tony? Afternoon, Emily. Investigators tell us the victim has died. He's uh, identified as a 47 year old man from the Vicksburg area. Police say he was shot around 5 30 this morning at the Shell station in downtown Augusta when investigators say a man tried to take the car he was riding in. Police tell us the suspect then tried to take another car but failed and ran away. He ran on foot. Investigators caught up to him about a half mile north of town. They were able to take him to, into custody. We talked with the Augusta police chief, who was among the law enforcement officers who, who took him into custody. He said he's glad they were able to take him in relatively soon after the shooting, but of course still sad to hear the news that the victim in this case has died. Police also caught the gun. That's something that they're thankful for, worried that kids in the area might have come across it. We don't know if the suspect in this case will appear in court today. We're going to stay in touch with investigators to try and learn more about that. Neighbors we talked to say they came into work near the Shell station, saw the police, and we're just very saddened to hear this news, but very pleased to hear the suspect has been caught and that that gun was found as well. Again, we'll be monitoring to see if this suspect appears in court. His name has not yet been released, but we'll post details as we learn them at woodtv.com and later today on 24 Hour News Day starting at 5. Back to you. Now, if someone wants your vehicle, you want to give it up. You want to give them the vehicle. Don't fight them over it. You can always replace your car. Uh, it's kind of sad when you hear a story where someone lost their life over something like this. And also in the newscast, they talked about how uh, the assailant tried to take a vehicle, but then he had to go to a different vehicle. I'm assuming that the car that he originally wanted to take and decided not to take, he looked in and found out that it was a standard transmission, a manual transmission vehicle, and he didn't know how to drive it. So if you want to make sure no one ever steals your car, buy a manual. Because people won't be able to drive it away. Um, but that is kind of a sad story. So once you're inside the car, there's really four things that I want you to do. So write down this first one. And this is what we were talking about with carjacking. Lock the doors. Okay, so lock the doors. So no one can get in. We're going to go through this relatively quick. Second thing is to adjust your seat. Make sure that you're comfortable. You're going to see that in the video that I did. And I'll talk about um, positioning of your hands on the wheel, how to grab it. But make sure, and most cars will have it on the left side of your driver's side seat. Now, some cars will have a, a lever uh, between your legs and the front of the seat that you have to pull up to move the seat up or back. But really, on most cars now, it's going to be on the left-hand side. And it does allow you to bring the seat up or down and to move it forward or back. You have uh, multiple adjustments that you want to be able to use. Then the second, uh, third thing here is to lock the seat belts. Tomorrow's class is going to all be about safety equipment. It's about seat belts, airbags, and helmets. So we're going to talk a, a lot about that. But the thing I want you to write down is that you are responsible for everybody inside your vehicle. Now, it's the law if they're under 18, they have to be in a seatbelt. But even if they're 19 or 20 and legally they don't have to have one, I want you to write down, if they get injured, it's on your dime. You're the one paying for their injuries. So to keep your insurance current and low, 
make sure that people have their seatbelt on because if your insurance company has to pay out tens of thousands of dollars to help pay for medical bills, the next time you try to get insurance, it probably won't be the same that you're paying. So to save money, make sure everybody does the right thing and uses seatbelts. And the last thing that the of the four things that you need to do is just your mirrors. A lot of people only do the rear view mirror, but notice on the bottom picture that the side view mirror has a very small portion of the side mirror looking at your vehicle. We can see the vehicle off to the left and that's why you want to see your car in relationship to the other vehicle. That's an improperly adjusted mirror. All right, when you're learning to drive, it's good to see a little bit of your car with what's coming up on the side. It gives you reference. This is what it would look like. Notice that in the rear view mirror, you can see the white truck on the left and on the right, you can see the light blue car. See them in the side mirror, see them in the rear view mirror. So there is some type of an overlap. On the left side, it's the orange line. On the right side, it's the dotted blue and the blue line. And you can see that there is some overlap, okay? Now, what they're telling people that once you get skilled at driving and using your mirrors, you want to el eliminate the, the overlap. So you're going to push your mirrors out a little bit further. Notice in the rear view mirror here in the picture that you can no longer see the car in the left side mirror anymore. And you can't see the car in the right side mirror. And you can see with the green line and the blue line, they just barely intersect at the very, very top. And the orange and the green just barely intercept down at the bottom. So this would be a, a skilled driver who's been driving for a while. He doesn't need to know where his side of his vehicle is. Now, depending on the type of vehicle that you have, uh, you, most cars now still have a key that you're going to put it in the ignition, turn all the way to the right, and that will uh, allow you to start the car. Um, cars have a transmission, could be a standard or it could be an automatic. If it is a manual transmission, you're going to have to use a clutch. We're going to have a, a probably about a 15-minute uh, discussion about driving a standard vehicle sometime later. We're not going to do it tonight. Uh, steering wheel, we're going to see that in the video a little bit later, so I'm not going to talk about it now. And same thing with the accelerator and the brake. I think if you've done any driving, you basically know where they're located. Although, I get people that do not know which one's the brake and which one's the accelerator. So those are my real beginner drivers, and we'll take care of you when we get out to drive for the first time. But most of you, I feel pretty confident you know where the accelerator and the brake is. Let's go through the gear selection really quick. Uh, park is for locking the transmission whenever you bring your car to a stop. You should be in park. That's also the gear that you need to be in when you start your car. Reverse is for going backwards and is for neutral. Uh, that's the only position besides park that you can start a car in. And D is the gear that you're going to use mostly for moving the car forward. Now, if you look just beyond the drive gear, there's usually an S or an L or a 1 or a 2. Those are lower gears. And I do want you to write this down so you understand. That is to be used when you're going up a hill or down a hill, when you're either towing something or in bad weather. It brings what we call the torque of your engine to a lower RPM to allow your engine to pull your car or to cause your car to slow down more effectively. You don't start out every day when you pull away from your driveway in low one, then go to two, then to drive. You don't have to do that. When you're on level ground, you can just go right into drive and the car will shift for you if it's an automatic. So that's that. Uh, I don't think in the video I, I mentioned a, a funny story, but the reason why I go through this, and usually on your shift, you're going to see the first letter. I actually had a student that um, put the car in reverse, and I wanted them to put it in drive to go forward, but they put it in reverse. To, and I said, what are you doing? I want you to go forward. I want you to go and drive forward. And they said, I thought R was for ride. They looked at the gear shift, and they thought R was for ride. So some people do not know what these meanings are. 
So there's the driver's ed vehicle. There's the, the shift pattern. And uh, you'll just get acquainted with that once we get out in the car. Uh, I do want both hands on the wheel. Now the recommended positions, eight and four, nine and three, 10 and two is what most textbooks uh, promote. I think it's a good safe uh, hand position, but I'm not completely strict on being perfectly eight, four, nine, three, 10 and two. If you're a little bit off, like at two o'clock and nine o'clock or eight o'clock and one o'clock, as long as you've got both hands on the wheel and we're positioning our car on the road correctly and we're making good turns, I'm going to probably leave you alone with what you do with the wheel. But if you're not making good turns, then I'm going to try to correct the way that you're grabbing the wheel. Um, the hand position will also help you with um, parking. So the three hand positions that I want you to be familiar with is one hand backing. So you're putting your left hand up at 12 o'clock when you go in reverse. Hand over hand is when you're turning from the top of the wheel, going from 8 o'clock towards 4 o'clock, and then the other hand's coming over over the top of the wheel and grabbing it. And push-pull is from the bottom, pushing and pulling the wheel from the bottom. Do not drive the car putting your hands on the middle portion of the, of the steering wheel because that's where the airbag is. And then the tilt position is underneath the steering wheel. And then, of course, you've got your horn in the middle. So we'll see that a little bit later. So there's um, my wife, and she's doing the one hand on top, and she's going to steer backwards. Uh, this is a person that's getting ready to make a left-hand turn, so the right hand is going to go over from the 3 o'clock position over to the 11 o'clock, and then the left hand comes up at the top at 12 and finishes the turn. Push-pull is when you're grabbing at 8 and 4, and you never bring your hands any higher than those two hand positions. You're pushing and pulling the wheel from the bottom portion. That is push-pull. Uh, write down dead pedal. I'll almost guarantee that none of you, and you can put this in the comments, so I'm going to see, write down yes or no. How many people knew that the dead pedal is that piece of plastic that's to the left of the brake? And if you know what the dead pedal is used for, write down what you think it's used for, okay? So I'm going to skip ahead on this one. So write down, see there it is. That piece of plastic is called the dead pedal. So in the notes, so I know who's here. Write down whether you knew what it was and what it, and write down what you think it's used for. And I'll tell you in about five minutes what it's used for. Okay, we're going to go through some definitions right now. The first one I want you to write down is light acceleration. Do not write down the whole thing. The only thing I want you to write down, it is the beginning of a smooth start and it's from a stop position. The problem with a lot of people is they push down way too much on the accelerator and they jump, they lurch forward. That is not light acceleration. So you want the car to move a little bit and as it starts to move, then you're pushing down on the pedal just a little bit harder. So light acceleration is just slight pressure on the pedal to move forward. Now remember, if I'm moving too fast, uh, fast, you can always go back and and look at these definitions. Uh, a couple of them will probably be on the midterm. Progressive acceleration. Let's see what we got here. See, everybody's saying no, but you got to, okay. Nobody knows. All right. Uh, progressive acceleration is a steady increase of pressure to get up to a certain speed. So after you do that light acceleration so the car doesn't um, go f go forward to... Uh, a few of you, I'm looking at the comments right now. So Sabrina, um, Zinya, and uh, Hannah's close. Um, Pavana's close. Okay, um, it is a footrest. It is a footrest, but this is what I want you to write down. A dead, a dead pedal is used when you go around a corner too fast. When you go around a turn too fast, you push on that, that left foot 
on that rest, that dead pedal, and it pushes your back up against your seat. And we're going to see that in the video. I put that in the video. Okay, next um, definition is cover brake. That is when you're hovering your foot over the brake pedal and you're anticipating something's going to happen. This is when I can tell you've done some driving. Remember I told you I can tell in 10, 15 minutes who's done a lot of driving? Well, it's more how you use the brake than how you use the accelerator. A skilled driver uses the brake better than they use the accelerator. So the dead giveaway is how people use the brake, how they brake, not how they accelerate. So when you think something's going to happen, like a pedestrian's going to come out in front of you, you're taking your foot off the accelerator and you're just hovering over that brake pedal. When you think the light's going to change, when you think uh, the car in front of you is going to brake even before they hit their brake pedal, you're going to be covering the brake. Control braking is just regular braking. That's just firm, steady, even pressure on the brake pedal. It's used in non-emergency situations. Now, the word pitch here says try not to have the vehicle pitch forward i'm going to come out of this for a second so you can see me okay i'm in a car i'm grabbing the steering wheel when the car pitches you go forward and then back so whenever the car goes forward and back the car is pitched and you've come to a legal stop so whenever you feel that pitch then you're breaking to a complete stop. If you never feel that little lurch going forward and then backwards, the car is still in movement. It's still going forward and you haven't come to a stop. Now, what's a limousine stop? A limousine stop is just prior to where you're going to be stopping at the stop sign. You're going to let go of the brake pedal a little bit, let the car go up about another five, 10 feet to the line, and then you're going to reapply the brakes just a little bit harder to come to a stop. If you've ever been in a limousine, you know that they had to train the driver to make sure that when he stops, that he doesn't have the people in the back lunch forward because they could be eating or drinking. And they're going to get a lot of complaints with a limousine company of a driver that stops too hard. So that what we or what they've been taught to do is what they call a limousine stop. Take away most of the pitch before the stop line and then inch up a little bit further to do that last stop that you need to do. Trail braking is used for backing up in reverse. If you're in heavy stop and go traffic, that will help you go forward a little bit. Um, going at a slow walking pace in a parking spot. When you, when you park, when you do angle parking, perpendicular parking or parallel parking, you're not on the accelerator when you're doing this. You're on the brake pedal. So when you're going for your test, you don't want to be late to get to the brake. So go to the brake early and then, and then use the brake with the trail braking technique. Thresh, threshold braking is emergency braking. That's hitting the brakes as hard as you possibly can. You and I I always tell my students you cannot break the brake. So you could you could put your foot almost right through the floorboard and you're gonna be okay. Now, of course the car is gonna stop real quick, but that is what it's needed. It's for an emergency stop when you want every ounce of pressure going towards those brakes so you don't hit the car in front of you or you don't hit the pedestrian. You do not want to be late or light, late or light on your brake when someone comes out in front of you. The accelerator and the brake. I want you to write down the brake is the most important pedal. It keeps you from going to where you don't want to go. It's more important that you don't hit something than to be going the speed limit. You don't want to hit pedestrians. You don't want to hit cars in front of you at a stop sign. You've got to learn the correct pressure, whether it be trail braking or threshold braking, control braking. It's got to be the right amount at the right time. An experienced driver. So when your dad or your mom gets a rental car on vacation, Coming off the plane, they go to the rental company. Even though they've never driven a Dodge before, 
they're going to be able to know how much pressure to use on the gas and the brake. Probably it's going to take them roughly 10 minutes to get used to it. It's going to take you a little bit longer. I think if you are honest and, and you think about it, if you've driven multiple cars, the difference between the brake and the gas on all those cars are completely different. This is why it's also very important not to bring a strange vehicle to your driving test. And by the way, remember, you're taking the vehicle to the driving test to be tested in. They don't provide one for you. So take the car that you feel most comfortable with when you go for your driving test. Now, the other thing that I want you to think about is that both pedals can make you go faster or slower. So if you want to go slower and you're on the gas pedal, you're letting go of it. If you're going down a hill and you're braking too much and you're starting to go up a hill, just let go of the brake pedal. The car is going to pick up more speed. So a good driver knows when to let go of the brake pedal or let go of the gas pedal to do the opposite. So knowing when to slow down by letting go of the gas pedal and knowing when to speed up, letting go of the brake pedal. Now the parking brake keeps the car from rolling and I do not use the parking brake uh, every time that I drive with a student, which means that when we leave, it shouldn't be on. And when we get back, I usually don't engage it because we drive so much, it's going to really ruin the cable. It just stretches it out too much. So I only use the parking brake if we're parking on a hill going up or we're on a hill going down so the car can't move. But if I'm on level ground, I'm not setting the parking brake. Now, if your parents want you to do it, then by all means, do what your parents want you to do. Okay, that's what they want you to do for bringing the car to a complete stop using the parking brake. Then you should do it. Uh, gauges, um, notice there is a yellow light. This is going to come up on the video, so I'm not going to really spend a whole lot of time with this. So every instrument panel is going to be a little bit different. So before the car is already on, you've already started it. Now it's a, a chance where you already done, you locked your door, adjusted your seat, locked your seat belt, did your mirrors, started the car. You're looking at the gauges now, making sure everything's okay. Now this is what I want you to write down. Anytime that you see a red light, Okay, it needs your attention. So write that down. A red light on your instrument panel is a warning that something has to be tended to. You gotta take care of it. It could ruin your car. Now in this case, it's just a seat belt, but a seat belt's pretty important. So you gotta do it or else you're gonna get that annoying beep, beep, beep noise. Now the yellow light that you see in this picture is basically an indicator that I need an oil change. Do I have to do it right now? No. Should I do it later tomorrow or the next day? Probably. Don't want to go too long without not doing an oil change. You just don't know how much you've, you've got in your vehicle unless you've checked it. So take a moment and go through the gauges. So I'm going to go through these super quick. Okay, speedometer tells us how fast we're going. Odometer tells us how many miles the car has been driven. A tripometer is used not only for when you go like on vacation about how far you've gone, but it also helps you determine what your gas mileage is. And if your fuel gauge ever breaks, you can use your tripometer um, as a gas gauge. Most people don't realize that. If you know that you get 30 miles to the gallon, you just know that your car gets 30 miles consistently and the fuel gauge breaks, go to the gas station, fill up with gas till it's full. If you've got a, a 15 gallon tank car, you're going to go 450 miles on a full tank of gas. So you're looking at your tripometer, set it to zeros so when you fill up to full. And as you're driving now with no fuel gauge, you can see, oh, I'm at 300 miles now on my tripometer. You know, you're, you're less than half of a tank left. You get close to 450, you're going to be running on empty. But you've got to full it. You got to fill it full every time, and you've got to set the tripometer to zeros. We'll talk more about the fuel gauge later. Alternator. All I want you to write down is for electrical problem. Um, it's going to be a light or a gauge that will come on. Same thing with temperature. You'll see a C or H in the vehicle. Uh, brake warning lights. Um, that's what we're going to be doing a little bit later at the end of um, of class. Is using 
a sheet that I provided on Facebook. You're going to tell me what the gauges mean. Oil pressure, uh, stop driving. This only tells you that you don't have a lot of uh, oil going through the engine. So if the oil light comes on, and that's different than the light that I had. That was just a maintenance light saying you should get your oil changed. It's not the actual oil light. Other lights you should be familiar with, parking lights, seat belts, um, abs, high beams, day running lights, emergency lights. You should know the locations. Should be able to go right to it. You should also be able to go to these without looking down. You should Your hands should be able to feel and know right where they are. Because if you're taking your eyes away from the road, it's not going to be safe. Should be familiar with the heat and the air on most cars now. You're going to have dual controls, left side, right side, uh, radio, how to set up your uh, phone so you can use Bluetooth. Uh, by the way, under 18, you can't use Bluetooth. You can only use um, the 911 number on Bluetooth. They don't want you talking on the phone at all. A lot of people think it's just handheld, but it's no, no phone usage at all. The gas lever to put fuel in your car, trunk release and the hood release, all that is on the floor. Should give you some idea of how to access. Headlights on the driver's ed vehicle is on the left side on your directionals. Windshield wipers are over on the right side, but you'll see that in the video. Okay, so right where we need to be. I'm right on, right on schedule. Okay, this picture that you see right here, it's on Facebook, okay, right where you took the test, the quiz. If you scroll down, today's post will have this located, and I have two sheets, okay? So this is what I want you to do. You do not have to do this just by looking at these symbols and guessing. This is, I told you, I wanted you to bring a car manual. Use your car manual. You could even go online if you want to Google uh, car controls symbols. I don't care. I just want you to try to do it and guess. And if you really don't know what it is, I want you to research it and find what the answer is. Okay? So we've got two sheets. This sheet and then this sheet. All right? And then tomorrow we'll go through that. Now what I want to do is I want to show you the video. I'm going to see if this actually works. Okay, I'm going to throw, I'm going to run this through my Internet Explorer and try, because I couldn't download it, the whole video, because it's like I said, it's about 25 minutes. So this will take us right to the end. So this is what you should see. I've been teaching driver's ed for over 30 years in my local area and I'm proud to say that my students have never caused a crash in all that time. And when you look at it, over 30 years, that's probably about a million and a half miles with students. And to say that they've never caused a crash says a lot about the students and it says a lot about the instruction that they're getting. So let's talk about the five things that you should do before you get ready to drive. Number one, take a quick look around the vehicle, looking at the front, both sides, and looking to the rear. What would you be looking for? Are your tires a little bit soft? Are you looking for fluids that are leaking out on the side of the vehicle? Are there any broken pieces of glass around your vehicle? Or maybe things that have been left behind the car before you get in. As you approach your vehicle, always have your keys ready to press the alert button if anything looks a little bit suspicious around your vehicle. You never know when someone could be inside the vehicle or around the vehicle ready to take you or the keys of your car and to carjack you. So get inside your vehicle. Once you get into the vehicle, four other things should happen. One, you should lock your door, okay? Making sure that nobody's able to get into your vehicle uh, once you start driving. It also gives you added protection in case you are hit 
that the frame of the vehicle won't twist and pop open a door. The second thing you want to do is to adjust your seat, not only for uh, height and depth, but to make sure that your hand position will be adequate to make good turns. Now, how do you know that you're close enough to the steering wheel? Probably the best way to do this is to rest your wrist at the very top of the steering wheel to make sure that when you drop your hands down into 10 and 2, 9 and 3, 8 and 4, that you have a slight flex to your elbow to make a good turn to the left and to the right. So you've locked your doors, you've adjusted your seat. You need to lock your seat belt, make sure that it is clicked in, you hear the click, that your lap belt is where you normally have your belt below your belly button, and to make sure that your harness here is not too low or too high where it's rubbing up against your shoulder. The last thing that you need to do is to adjust your rear view mirror. So basically you can see all the back window. The side mirror control button is on the door handle where the L and an R. Other cars may have something where it's a little of a twist knob with an L and an R and a toggle switch. But basically you want to adjust your mirror so that you see very, very small amount of the car in your side view mirror. So do the left and then do the right. Make sure that it's adjusted just right. Also notice in this side mirror that we have a blind spot mirror. This is a uh, convex uh, mirror that allows you to see a wider angle. Some cars actually give you a blind spot monitor where it will actually flash a light indicating that someone is entering the blind spot area. So once you've gotten everything adjusted, then you can basically take a look at your instrument panel. To start a vehicle that doesn't have a key, one of the things that you have to make sure that you have on your person is something called a phobe. And that phobe allows you just to hit this power button and the car starts right up. If you take a look at the instrument panel, lights will come on and then turn off as the computer checks each item to make sure that it's in running condition. Now the thing to remember about lights on the instrument panel, yellow lights tell you things are activated. Red lights indicate that it needs your attention. If you take a look at the dash, the speedometer is the dial off to the right. Notice that the seatbelt light is on. There's a passenger in the vehicle without a seatbelt, so make sure that all your passengers have their seatbelt locked. Notice the seatbelt light is now off, has been clicked. The ready light that's yellow is an indicator that the car is on. If you listen carefully, you can't hear anything but just the air conditioning. This is a Camry, Toyota Camry hybrid, which is extremely quiet. This is why you have to take a look at your instrument panel to make sure that your car can be put in the gear to move. Because if that ready light's not on, you're not going anywhere. If you look at the dial off to the left, because it is a hybrid, it has a whole bunch of information about that hybrid technology. Not too important for someone that's just learning to drive, but someone that's trying to squeeze out every little bit of miles per gallon out of the gas, they're going to be paying attention to that dial way over to the left. Your fuel gauge is at the bottom of your speedometer. Always try to keep your car at least half full. I always recommend my students to let me know when it's below half. It's not their responsibility to pay for gas, but it is their responsibility to make sure that we have enough fuel to do what we need to do. So we are definitely all set with fuel. If you take just a look to the very bottom of that gas gauge dial, there is a symbol of a gas pump with an arrow. That is indicating which side that you need to bring your vehicle over to in order to pump gas. If you pull to the opposite side, you're going to have to put that hose over the top of the vehicle, or over the hood, or over the trunk. Not a very good idea. You're going to kind of look a little bit foolish doing that. Now, 
probably the most important thing with this instrument panel, and remember, every instrument panel will be slightly different. So look at your owner's manual. Make sure that you know all your dials, your gauges, all your lights and what they indicate. In this Toyota Camry, we also have a speedometer right smack dab in the middle. It is digital. Very easy to know what speed you're going when you're looking at a number. Rather than looking at the dial, trying to guess whether it's 5, 10, whatever it is, really hard to do when you're learning to drive because your focus should always be on the road. So a quick look down at the speedometer, see the number that you're trying to aim for, what the speed limit is, and then uh, look back up at the road. It's also important to see that there is a distance to empty. So we get to go 498 miles on the remainder of the gas that we have in this vehicle. We have an outside temperature gauge telling us it's 77 right now. Why is that important in a vehicle? Because in colder temperatures, you want to know when the road is going to start to freeze over. At the very bottom of this indicator, you have what gear that you're in. We're in park. So when you depress the brake pedal and go over to the gear shift, the shift, depending on what gear that you put it in, it will be indicated right there in the middle for you. You also have a odometer, which will also act as a tripometer if you were to press a button. And this computer screen can change according to what you want to find out about the vehicle. This is actually telling you that we are going southeast at the time. If we press it again, the radio is off. If we press it again, it could be linked up to your text messages. We go back to settings. We're back at the first gauge. And this will also give us multiple subcategories that we could actually go through telling us what we're averaging for miles per gallon on fuel economy. There's your tripometer if you want to gauge how far you've been on a trip. This is telling you how the hybrid battery is working at the time. And tire pressure, which is also very, very helpful. But the thing to remember about the tire pressure uh, gauge inside of a vehicle, it is a rough estimate of what you have for tire pressure. I always keep on my vehicle a separate gauge that I can actually go outside, put onto the tire stem, and get an accurate reading. These are a little bit more accurate than the pencil type gauges that you have, although it's better to have something like that than nothing at all. So I always keep that in my vehicle. So let's go through the rest of the car with a quick rundown. Let's take a look at the directionals. If you take a look at the directional, if you take a look at the directional, up is right, you can see the light flashing, down is left. In all the years that I've been teaching, there has not been a class where I haven't had a couple students that do not know their left and their right. They don't even know what to do with the directional lever. To go left, do I go up, do I go down? They're very confused, they're very nervous when they start to drive. One of the easiest ways that I've been able to teach left and right is that I have them open up their fingers and as they turn the wheel in the direction that they wanna go, it is indicating with the tail light which direction we're going. Very easy to remember right and left. So here's a left. Put your fingers open. If you're grabbing the wheel, go down. Directional uh, light is on, indicating that we are going to the left. After a while, they'll be able to do that, and then they just flick it with their fingers and not have to worry about what to do. But put it between the two fingers. Pretty, pretty helpful for someone that's been struggling. If you take a look at the directional lever, we also have a couple settings for our lights. I always recommend driving with your lights on auto. 
so as it gets darker uh, they will come automatically it also gives you a low voltage light during the day so when it's foggy um, kind of overcast your car will stick out when people look in their rearview mirrors they'll be able to see your car up from there is your parking lights and we'll talk more about that later but parking lights are not to be used when you're moving it's when the car is in parked and not moving we'll talk about that a little bit later low beams all the way up indicator that you've got full use of your low beam if you take your directional lever and push it forward notice the blue light that comes on indicating that your high beam is on so if you push it forward to activate the high beam bring the lever back towards you to turn it off not every car has it in this sequence once again look at your owner's manual know what your car has your first driving lesson with your parents or with a friend whoever should be in a parking lot getting used to the controls because you do not want to be driving searching for levers searching for buttons searching for gauges when something is going wrong your focus has to be on driving it has to be on the position your speed interacting with other cars and pedestrians the minute you take your eyes off the road and start focusing where your windshield wipers are or how to turn off your high beams you are not going to stay in your lane you are going out of your center position on the roadway and now you are becoming dangerous um, cars are now equipped with info centers so most of the buttons here in the middle will be for like your radio uh, for Bluetooth, things like that, up, uh, hanging up your phone, um, different modes that you have on your info center, which is right there. Now remember, your info center will also be on most cars now. Your backup camera. And your backup camera should be another aid to help you in reverse. Do not entirely go by what you see in your backup camera because it does have a limited amount of view so you're still going to have to look in your side view mirrors rear view mirror and then possibly turning your head in any direction that you're going to go let's take a look at the lever over here to the right of the steering wheel this is your windshield wiper on a Toyota and you basically have a few positions you can see right here we are in the off position so if we were to go down from the off position we're gonna go into intermittent and then your intermittent also has a dial that allows you to change the speed then you have low and then you have high you take a look at the center of your console you basically have your hazard lights emergency flashes whatever you want to call them you've got your temperature now in this car we have dual temperature so you can change uh, according to what you want to have for the vehicle this will con control the fan you have your front defroster you have your rear defroster you have the mode where the air is being circulated. Also notice that the uh, defroster comes up. And then air circulation over here. And then your air. Now this is the beginning of August, so it is a little bit warm. So the air is on as we drive most days. But the thing to remember about your defroster is that when you have your defrosters on in the winter time, because people will be getting into the vehicle, they may be warm, especially um, students. They may have just come from um, a class or from a sporting event, and moisture is going to be inside the vehicle. It would be a good idea to put your car uh, in the uh, defroster mode with the air conditioning on to, uh, to get a lot of the moisture outside of the vehicle. You don't want to keep it inside the vehicle. You want to get out of it or else your windows are going to steam up a little bit. Uh, we mentioned the gear selector. 
on the gear selector, you've got to remember your foot needs to be on the brake. Kind of hard to see in the position that I'm in right now. Um, the pedal just in the middle that's got a horizontal position is your brake. Um, the pedal to the far right, of course, is your gas or accelerator pedal, and you should be able to pivot your foot uh, between the two pedals when you drive. It is not illegal to brake with your left foot and drive or accelerate with your right foot. It's not recommended for a new driver because they could be confused on what foot is on what pedal and both feet will actually go down. So I always recommend heel on the floor, pivot between the two pedals. If you make a mistake, then you can go over to the other pedal. But foot must be on the brake, must be depressed for you to put it in the gear that you want. Now you must follow the diagram all the way over to the right and down to get into reverse. Then you have neutral, drive, and then B, which is a lower gear. On some cars, you may have one or two. You may have SRL. These are lower gears that will provide more torque to your vehicle to get up a hill in bad weather or if you're towing something. Uh, it does provide some braking force uh, to your vehicle. Uh, also remember that the only two uh, gears that you can start your vehicle in is neutral and park. Uh, if you have any engine problems, can get the gear uh, selector out, maybe putting in a neutral and starting up, uh, that will get you going. In this particular vehicle, we have seat warmers. So we have that down here. So make sure you don't accidentally have that on in the middle of summer. You're going to put someone into a hot seat. It won't be too comfortable when they drive. Uh, back to the info center here. Uh, the thing I want to point out is that every car is going to be set up for the owner of the vehicle. So when I get a student in the vehicle, very important to under, let them understand that this is for backing up. We're going to use the backup camera. If we ever do listen to music, it will always just be on a station um, really, really at a very low, low volume. But not to mess around when you're learning to drive with um, the instrument info center here. Uh, it gets to be very distracting, so not a good good thing to do in a car that's that's moving. So let's just turn this off here, power this off. That's good. Um, parking brake on some cars are between the bucket seats, but in this particular vehicle it's down far left underneath the instrument panel take your left foot push down on that parking brake and then push down to deactivate it uh, just below that you can see uh, over here is a piece of plastic right here is what we call a dead pedal and this dead pedal you push your left foot like I am right now is this provides if you take a look what I'm doing with my back notice that when I'm pressing on my left foot my back goes against the back of my seat. And that's allowing me to, to stay upright. Think about this, if you're going, if you keep your left foot, see how a lot of people may keep their left foot underneath their right foot? If you take a look, if I'm making a turn right now, notice what my upper body is doing. It's leaning. So in case of a crash, the airbag is only protecting your shoulder and not your upper body. Pressing on your left foot presses your back up against the seat and allows the airbag to do what it's meant to do, is to protect all your vital organs between your shoulder blade and your belly button. So don't put that foot underneath. Don't lean into your turns. Stay upright in your driving. Now, while we're here talking about position, be extremely careful about people that want to get extremely close to the steering wheel. When you have your elbows pinned up against your body, it doesn't allow full rotation of the steering wheel. 
it doesn't allow the airbag to come out correctly and you're going to do some internal damage to your upper body and to your face. This is way too close to a steering wheel. Now when you go back, a lot of males think that they're at home in their easy chair. And they want to drive like this. One hand, a lot of times, if they've had some experience with driving and they have basic controls of a car, they think driving is more comfortable this way. Same problem as being too close. It doesn't allow you to have the right hand position or to allow you to turn the wheel in a manner to handle most emergencies. Could you drive straight down the road like this? Absolutely. But you put a child that's coming out in front of you, an animal, you're, you're too relaxed. You're too relaxed. So as we said earlier, what you want to make sure that you're doing is allowing yourself to have your wrist at the top of the steering wheel. So when you drop down 10 and 2, 9 and 3, 8 and 4, then you're in the best position. If you take a look at someone drive, most people will find a position that's good for them. It may be a little bit off-center, like 1 o'clock and 8 o'clock, or 10 o'clock and 3 o'clock, but they still have contact, both hands on the wheel. The thing to remember, there are no laws, as far as I know, in any state that says that you have to have both hands on the wheel. This is a technique. This is about safety. This is controlling the vehicle. Could you drive with one finger? Could you drive with your knees? Maybe your dad used to tell you, oh yeah, I used to drive, I used to drive with my knees. Of course, the steering wheel is moving. As long as the wheel is moving, the car is moving with the steering wheel. So how you do that doesn't really matter as long as you have complete control of the vehicle. Now, a lot of people say, do not turn a wheel from the top because now with the technology with airbags, the airbags will be coming out at your arm and your arm will be coming out at you. I do understand that, I do believe that. But I don't believe that in an emergency that push-pull where most people are turning the wheel from the bottom at uh, 8 and 4 o'clock and pushing and sliding the wheel is going to allow you to make that full turn. If you take a look at a steering wheel with both hands on the wheel, you could basically go on a face of a clock from 3 o'clock to 6 o'clock with one fluid motion. Same thing from 9 o'clock to 6 o'clock very quickly. When you do push-pull, Push-pull only allows you to go six inches at a time. Takes too long in an emergency. So I'm still a firm believer at higher speeds, you're going hand over hand. In a parking lot like we're in right now, you're gonna probably go into a parking space because of slow speed with a push-pull, be more relaxed at a, at a lower speed. One of the things we mentioned earlier was your tire pressure that you can check it on the uh, one of the different modes inside the vehicle indicating what you have for tire pressure and how to use a gauge on the tire stem. Now all tires on the tire wall will indicate the maximum pressure that you put into a tire. But the best way to do this, if you come around the corner here and take a look, right on the door jam will give you an indicator of what you have for tire size and also what's recommended for tire pressure. Notice it says 35 and I believe what we had on the um, indicator in the vehicle, we were right between 34 and 36. The other thing that I want to point out on the tire, on the door jam right here, is your VIN number. Your VIN number is like your social security number that you have that identifies you. It's very particular to you. A car uses a VIN number, vehicle identification number. It's located here on the door and if you come around to the front we can see it located right here in the front window. This also will be indicated on your registration. That way, if your vehicle ever has a recall, how do they send out all the information to 
Toyota owners that you have a brake problem. They take a look through a computer system and they run VIN numbers through the state system and send out notices to people that their car has a current recall. So it's important to know this. You can actually go to a website, and I'll list this up above, where you can go, put in your VIN number, and it will indicate what type of recalls that your car may have had. This is helpful when you go to buy a vehicle. I'd use Carfax. That's also a helpful way to find out if there's been any type of recalls. But you can also just do this. Um, I think it's safercar.gov. And uh, you put in a VIN number and model year, and it'll give you all the information about recalls. So these are just a few helpful tips to get you out on the road going for your first drive. Well, thanks for watching uh, my first video for Peace Love. Okay, hopefully uh, that was uh, helpful uh, to at least see the inside of the car. Um, get to see me, how I'm going to instruct when you get behind uh, the wheel. So there really isn't a whole lot of homework to do with reading. So all I want you to do is those two sheets from the Facebook page on the gauges that we kind of just went through. And tomorrow we're going to get into seat belts, airbags, and helmets and I'll explain we're gonna have a special project dealing with those three subjects so um, well we're down quite a few um, please remember to put your name on the comments for YouTube and then to text me that you are leaving so I know that you are here I can see what time it is so you stay to the very end um, it is important to be in attendance because that is this a pass-fail class and the state does give me that um, ability to tell people that they didn't meet the requirements of uh, this remote online driver's ed. So they said for remote to work and for people to get credit, they have to be here for the entire thing. So don't check out. Be here for the whole time. So for tonight, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow, 4 o'clock. Remember to download those Facebook pages to do your homework. And we'll see you tomorrow at 4. Have a good night.